Hello and welcome to the Practical Leadership Podcast, where I interview great leaders and try to extract their wisdom and experience for you to learn from and hopefully avoid making their mistakes. Check out practical-leadership.academy because you want to help your new managers succeed with hybrid or remote working. Barry Foster, thank you very much indeed for joining me. It's a pleasure, Paul. It's lovely to join you from sunny South Africa, getting a bad cold this week, and you being in the UK. Well, I can only feel sympathy for you because I think we're hitting, what, nine degrees today. And this is May. I'm not, I'm not impressed. Miserable. Would you mind introducing yourself properly to both of my listeners? I never know what it means to do that properly, but let me see if I can give it a shot. So I'm a lucky guy who started off by studying linguistics, became a linguist, teaching linguistics at a university, got involved with academic development, which started my career in learning. Uh, Somewhere in and amongst all of that, started running a computer center, which is, uh, for people of my age, was how we taught computers and and those kinds of things. Uh, And then did a master's degree in e-learning, which got me into corporate learning. And at that point, a really interesting project. It was the amalgamation of four banks in, in, in South Africa, the bank, which is now called APSA Bank, bought a television station, and they used that broadcast television station and e-learning to retrain all of the 30,000, 40,000 people they had, which was a massive new thing in the country. And that just started the journey. I moved on from there uh, to IBM and Lotus on something called Lotus Learning Space, which was like an early LMS, um, and moved from there, started the, did some work in Botswana. Uh, lived my life, half my life here and in France, doing some work in implementing learning systems in uh, in France, especially at EADS and, and the rest of Europe, then moved back, joined PwC, and since then have been doing all kinds of things, ending off again with HR technology and a kind of spokesperson for the future of work, and then thought, I'm being daft, I should listen to myself. I uh, did an early retirement and joined a startup in the digital learning space, did that for a for a year and a half or two, and then recently joined BDO to start the new business again. All in this kind of talent intersection with intelligence and technology space. There's a lot going on just now as well. And by the way, Lotus, was that Lotus Notes? Yes, it was oh, just that. Oh my holy moly, you just me. That's a blast from the past. I'm an absolute fanboy. Is it still around? In fact, so- it's not. But Paul, if you're my age... By the way, you can only do things in Microsoft SharePoints and other tools that you could have done in Lotus in the 1990s. Yeah, I remember that. Creating these little wonderful little databases and all these phenomenal mm-hmm. stuff. Phenomenally powerful tool. Anyway, future of work, technology, skills, talent, people. There's a little bit going on right now. If you think people are being concerned, now the, the pattern that you see out there is your job won't be taken by AI, it'll be taken by somebody who uses AI. And then you get the future of work. Mm. And then you've got, well, what is the, does work have a future for the majority of us email jockeys? Does working in the workplace, as in going into an office, is that a requirement anymore? Does it, where's productivity? Where's, talk to me, bring some light to the darkness. <laughs> So I, I, I've, been, I've been contemplating this for a while. So I don't remember a few years ago, you've got the Linda Grattons of this world who talk about the 100-year work life, and we'd all been pontificating, but it was the the first part of that was the fear-mongering stage. Okay. We pulled up statistics to tell you about what robotics, automation, robots, uh, AI, drones, and whatever else was going to do to to the workforce. And it was going to diminish it, take away jobs, uh, you'd have to reskill. And the, the truth is probably still that people will need to either reskill or upskill. And there's probably about uh, a, a good 100 million people who need to do that. And then there's a whole group of people that will probably need to reskill completely, which is another 100 million. So globally, there's a space for learning. Th- that's the one thing I can see. What happens if we don't learn? Well, we'll probably be left behind in some way or form. Is that normal or abnormal? Through each of the previous industrial revolutions, there's been, there was a stage where people were left behind. And then either gradually or fast, depending on which one it was, they'll start catching up again and we'll, 
will open our eyes. I think something similar will happen. I think to a degree, we're a little bit quicker on the update this time. But I, I think we've been lucky inadvertently because of COVID. A lot of people have learned at least some digital hybrid working skills in the in the COVID hiatus from the workplace. Um, have I seen organizations fully understanding what this would look like or embracing it to the extent where they are gaining from it? No, I haven't yet. I've seen a few organizations do that and thinking through how some of these technologies have already um, changed their workplace and have embraced it and gone further with it. I think many organizations are still still scared. I I hear a lot. I'm not I'm not an expert on what exactly is happening in the US and Europe. But I do hear that more and more organizations are asking their people to come back to the workplace. I think there's some good in that. But I also think that that's probably unrealistic. People won't in the next 10 years completely go back to work. So I said a lot of stuff. I think the workplace has changed. I think these technologies will change it. Are we ready for it? Some people are, but many, many people aren't. Will we catch up? I think so. Is the curve perhaps a little bit steep in the end? It might just be that there's a confluence of too many technologies that take us forward, which make it difficult for the rank and file to catch. That's a fairly broad, sweeping response to a fairly garbled (laughs) question, which I admit I posed to you. (laughs) It's a difficult question to answer, so I'm trying to think of all the angles. Um, Truth is, though, I'm actually glad that ChatGPT is getting the amount of attention it is purely because it is waking us up to both the potential as well as some of the downside that we need to be cognizant of. Mm. Well, I'm not a Luddite by any manner of means. Mr. Ludd and throwing his things and throwing his uh, his uh, sabots, or that's a different country, throwing their sabots into the machinery where we get sabotage. Right? Um, and let's go back to the very, very beginning where you had you talking about fear mongering. And I think if you look at who is mongering the fear, you have the consultants and you have the media. And the consultant's primary job is to continue their consulting career. So more research is necessary, is always the, the thing that you hear. And then swiftly followed by the news media, which whose job is not to tell you the truth. Their job is to continue. And the easiest way to do that, both from the consulting and the media's point of view, is to provoke some fear, pull out some statistics out of the backside, and we're all going to be doomed and gloomed, and it's all over. But humanity deals very well with slow-moving problems. But as you point out rightly, it's becoming a faster-moving problem than we've ever had. The number of users, the number of hours or days it took to get to however many millions of users on chat GPT, was it like five days to get to 10 million users or something like that? It was insane. The speed of change. That's, that's I think, is, is really going to be affecting a lot of people. The speed of change. Right. You had Walmart, even that Walmart years ago, looking at roboticizing the shelf stacking they had in many stores, recognizing that they were corporately and intentionally going to be putting many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people out of work whose only potential job would be shelf stacking. Mm. How'd you retrain? I mean, fair enough if you're an email jockey and you think you can retrain to something else. But when we take away the livelihoods of so many, so many different people, we talk about the future of work thinking that it's white collar a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I, I think it is, and, and it will be pervasive, except for one or two industries. And those industries are probably industries that are wholly or mostly people driven. So uh, medicine, allied health, those types of industries, perhaps a little bit of leisure inside of that. But for the rest, whether blue or white collar, I think you'll be affected. Mm. Um, And you are right. I don't know if you ever read Paul the book by uh, Thomas Friedman on thank you for being late. I think that is the feeling that we'll all have for a few years hence, is a little bit of feeling late the whole time, feeling as if you're not completely there yet. And whether it is chat GPT, and I I, I did some stuff recently uh, with that. Uh, The company I worked for just before I joined BDO, they're an e-learning digital development company. And what they what they've been experimenting is is with using Chat GPT and Dali to build their curricula and build the text and build some deep fakes and, and, and visuals. And in fact, they have been able to slice their production time by a third or more. Um, and so even in, even in very white collar uh, employee experience, digitally uh, skilled people are finding that they might be disintermediated. So I think so. I do think as well something else is going to happen. I'm not sure 
if this harks back to the old faith popcorn stuff where we start uh, thinking about the human side of all of this and it has it we, we see an increase in human related jobs so in leisure in hospitality in people traveling again uh, in ways and, th- and and in jobs and careers that we've not contemplated yet mm-hmm. I'm not only talking about the techie ones the techie ones I think are relatively they, they're not easy but they are probably easier to predict the very wise Mike Pino said to me a few days ago that he thinks in the knowledge age, access to applied knowledge and wisdom is much more valuable than access to data and information. And you're saying about the people being disintermediated as a result of the advance in technology, is this an opportunity for us? So we're not looking at increasing our skills to be able to use a piece of technology or do something. But is it an opportunity for us to rediscover wisdom? I'm always careful about that. Coming from... We spoke about coming from Lotus. I I, I was part of that whole knowledge management um, uh, journey. So I think there is a chance of us for us to gain some wisdom. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I also think that it's going to be a wisdom that's augmented by technology. Um, and I think some of it is insight. So some of the most interesting insights that I've had and read about in the last few years is, for instance, the work from Daniel Kahneman. And some of that's based because we are able to to do work on what the mind is doing whilst it's doing uh, things that are quite cognitive or very emotional, and we can determine whether people are making decisions that is based decisions based on 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 the emotions or or, or, or the rational. So we now know that it is mostly emotional. So we are learning a lot more in that kind of wisdom where we now know that. Uh, markets aren't rational, people aren't rational. We make most of that on a, on a very subliminal uh, part of our brain, which is which is the amygdala. So this is this is very difficult, I think. But I think that there's therein lies the interesting part, as we we getting technology to help us to understand some of these very human things. Ben, I mean, I think we we talk about we're we're discovering that we are making these. Uh... We're not a rational species. We're a rationalizing species. But you go back even to you know, seminal texts like the U.S. Declaration of Independence, and they recognize that humans weren't rational. They baked it into the operating rules of the nation. Of the nation. So we recognize that you know, people are driven by fear and temptation and all that. And so therefore, we're going to make sure that you can't screw with us. So they did it. They rec- we recognized it, I think, inherently in, our, in, in the wisest of us a long time ago. But I think now it's coming to the point where we are able to rationalize the fact that we are irrational and then cope with it in this emergingly data-driven, knowledge-driven world. Let me ask you a question, though, Paul. So let me turn the tables on you on this one. Please. So if we did have that kind of insight on, on the declaration, why is it that modern day organizations have either purposefully or otherwise forgotten that in uh, in the way that they operate? And I say that about organizations. The question is probably also true for politicians and uh, and others in, 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 in daily life, but especially organizations. I think they have rationalized themselves away from these truths. Totally. Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's um, there's a couple of reasons for it. One, I think, is the uh, uh, falling away from religiosity of some description. We're lacking in any sort of anchor in humanity, in, in, in focus. And I think another is the, the uh, drive for efficiency, starting with Ford and Taylor, and digging into, well, how do I programmatize, if this is a word, I'm making stuff up here, how do I turn this into ones and zeros? How do I discern that actually... That man spending too long lifting that shovel, he could spin, you know, breaking things down and moving further and further and further away from the reality of human existence, which is the conversation or the connection between two people. And you go back and you you, you walk out in the streets, even 20, 50 years ago today, and you see somebody selling something in the street or in the marketplace. They know that they're not going to say, this is better than that. They're making an emotional connection with you. This looks lovely on you, madam. You should buy it today because you know you're going out tomorrow. They're not, they're not telling you it's, it's three better than four. They're making an emotional connection. Humans do it. Organizations don't. And the organizations don't, especially the politicians. These politicians are so far removed even from the organizations. The politicians haven't had a real job. They've never had to hire or fire or sell. 
the organizations hate their salespeople because their salespeople, and I'm a salesman, their salespeople are deeply connected to the emotion that is between two people. Good salespeople don't sell features. They sell what happens after the thing has been used or the thing has been implemented or whatever. The, the effect, the emotional effect. And organizations don't get that. Politicians forget it. They're too far removed. We're baked out of ourselves, as you say. So if you now ask me the question again about what's going to happen and where am I concerned, I'm concerned that organizations haven't the, the deep-seated empathy, the emotional empathy built into, woven into the fabric of organizations to be able to think this through because they're going to try and do this rationally. Yeah. And that, I think, is big old problem for survival. Um, and you go, you, go, you go to Darwin and he's, it's the ones most responsive to change. And that's for changing an environment. And if you don't understand your environment and you're trying to change in an environment you don't understand or you're not willing to approach, there are problems on many levels there. Meta problems. So just to go back to, to so, so when you previously spoken, so one of those myths that you and I have spoken about, what, 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 one, one of my little bugbears is when organizations talk about efficiency. And of course, efficiency is important if you manufacture cars. But I, 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 I hark back. I, I worked on some ISO stuff many years ago. And one of, one of the guys, one of the lecturers said, the problem between efficiency and effectiveness is, is you can really build very good concrete life jacket. <laughs> Marvelous. But they're still concrete life jackets. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And I often think that organizations build their own concrete life jacket. What can we do about it? How would you recommend that we go about resolving the aforementioned problem with the future of what? Here we are, humans trying to do our best. I, I'm not. So, so I know that there's a whole uh, software uh, market and tool sets out there from talent intelligence to e-learning systems and a whole host of things in the key. But me, me as the individual. I would say irrespective of all of that, the biggest thing for all individuals, and it has to do with pure plasticity, so people's ability to learn, people's potential, is to go out and learn things, whether it is to be a plumber, to service your car, to find new neural paths, to start studying. Does that need to be in programming languages in Python? I don't think so. I think that there's a whole host of things. I just think people need to get out there and learn more. And it will be that we need to to help people with being more inquisitive or open the world to them in a, in a better way. And there, I think organizations, governments, and everybody has a responsibility to do so. Um, and if you look at some of the work that was done in Luxembourg and Singapore, and they started using, um, I think uh, Luxembourg calls it skills bridge, in, way, in which they realized that they they will have a shrinking workforce. They employ people from across Europe who come into this, into Luxembourg on a daily basis, but they will need to find alternatives for them. And that responsibility is theirs, not only the individuals, but both, both parties have a responsibility. It's therefore incumbent on the government to help find options for people to learn. Same is true for Singapore. I'm not sure the rest of the world's gotten on to those facts yet. And I, just, just from experience, Paul, I, I, I think you've done this as well. Is I, I've never had a real job description, so I'm not so worried about whether that changes or, or doesn't. Yes, I've worked for many organizations and I've done some interesting stuff, but I've also seen that you need to continuously learn. And whether that is formal or informal, I think that is what will, what will allow for resilience in fast changing time. I don't think that there's a smarter answer. Um, I don't think, of course, you can build um, safety nets for people. And, and I think governments should do that. And, and we need to think about what we can do around that. But the truth is, is we need to make it easy for people to learn new things as we continue on these paths. And the, the change will probably be in some areas will just be exponential. Now, the other thing is, is I, I think we've always thought that also only young people can do that. I'm not so sure that that's true. I often quote the fact that I think that more entrepreneurs and successful entrepreneurs are older than 50 as a good indication that there's a, there's a, there's a good chance for the older guys to do something. Plus, I think there's a good research to show that 40 and 50 year olds are actually very productive innovative users of technology. I had a wonderful chat with a um, lovely couple of people who specialize in the, the over 50, and uh, Dominique ben Dahou and Ellen Kosher, and they have this idea of wake up, shake up, and thrive. It's how diversity and inclusion isn't including people over 50. 
Yeah. Uh, so the title of the podcast is How to Get How to Avoid Getting Old. You should listen to that one. Um, how to Avoid Getting Old. And yeah, they're all about the fact that you have you know, some good research, actually, in the neuroplasticity of older people. It's not worse significantly no. than younger. Can old dogs learn new tricks? Only if they want to. Yeah. So I would now say all of these populist politicians should get off their soapboxes and start talking about the chances they can help people with, the opportunities that are out there to do that. Because I... I think that there's that level of plasticity. I've seen the the trouble the French president got himself into in terms of moving the, the retirement age. But the truth is retirement ages have moved to above 70 now. I, there's a beautiful it's, article. I don't oh, have it. Oh. It's a nice article in The Economist about two years old in which it was done mostly in the UK to show a correlation between education level and retirement age. And so somebody with a master's or a PhD probably now already has a retirement age of about 70. Yeah. Could be a more intellectual, brain-centered job rather than if you're a fireman, you want to retire at 52 because you're broken. And that is true for many blue-collar workers. But yeah. but also, for, so for, I, I always use this example. I think there's some YouTube videos on this. Have you seen these um, automotive manufacturing uh, companies in Germany, um, changing up some of their factories to be suited to 60 plus year olds. I have not. I am going to write that down and have a look. Wow. They, 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 they've rejigged them so that those people have more places to sit. And the reason they're doing this is because there's so much expertise in building luxury cars that you just can't replace quickly. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, a piece I saw in the US where they're struggling to replace absolutely essential infrastructure jobs like electricity line personnel. And it's, I'm going to say line men because they are all men because no woman in their right mind apparently want to do this job. Not that they're not welcome, but that's what it is. And there's the guys, guys who climb up these live 200,000 volt power lines and fix it. And they're all over 50, 60, 70. And nobody's coming in to do this anymore. And you think you've got problems with your grid today? Mm, okay, then you've got the heavy machinery workers, and then you've got it's basically people who have to work hard for a living. Nobody wants to do these jobs. Mm. I want to send email for a living, that's much easier. Yeah, I want to be an influencer. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll send my TikTok from 500 feet in the air getting zapped by <laughs> look, this is me. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure people are really. If, when young people ask me, you ask me this question, I say, when young people ask me what to study. I often these days say, go and do a trade. Oh, yeah. Yep. Really? You might have more satisfaction. You might love your job. You are going to have a lot more interaction with people. You won't be in the office and you'll be paid really, really well. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, you go off and you, you finish your job here. You finish your apprenticeship here as an electrician. And you have to struggle by aged 25 or 75 grand a year, you poor thing. Poor thing. Yeah. Oh, dear. I mean... It's wonderful. I, you know, I think barber college, it's a good thing to do. We train as a barber. People, you'll never outsource a haircut. It just isn't going to harm. At least if it does, I'm not taking one. Insert your head here. <laughs> <laughs> nail technicians, Paul. Yes. I've said to my daughters, if you ever decide on a new career, go for nail technician. Yep, totally. You know how much these things cost? My daughter's 11. She's like, can I have my nails done? No, you bloody can't. I need a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> so I, a nail. I'm convinced that but but perhaps this is the point though mm. yeah. people need to go and look at some of the traditional areas in perhaps a little bit of a non-traditional way rethink some of those things i i'm not sure exactly where the australian government is on this at the moment but it does sound that artisans have moved right to the top of the pile on people they want mm -hmm. yeah um, and I, I'm sure post-Brexit, the same is true in the UK. Well, you walk down any high street in the towns here, and it is the definition of the non-outsourced. It's uh, You get some grocery stores, of course, but you get the charity stores, the barbers, and the nail technicians, and it's about it, really. These are the things that loads, loads of them. My town here has, what, 50,000 people in it? We've got like 11 barbers. There's not that much hair in the <laughs> town. I don't know what they're doing, but anyway, oh. it's definitely a thing. Looking at traditional areas in non-traditional ways, having developing the ability to learn, looking at your potential, learning new things. That's your how to cope with the future of work. Learn new things. Mm. There you go. What would you like to thank younger Barry 
of doing. This led you to where you are. I've been thinking about this a little bit, but I haven't prepared. Uh-huh. So the thing I'm most grateful for is realizing somewhere the latter part of my school career that I like the interaction with people more than anything else and that I kept to it. That's the one thing. And the other one is that I kept on reading. Very simple. And what are you reading today? What are you listening? Huh. What do I read? I probably read at least two or three LinkedIn related articles on a daily basis. I read a business book like Adam Grant. I definitely read The Economist every Friday evening and throughout the weekend. Um, it's 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 my vanity fair kind of <laughs> it's the thing I read. Um, and then I do do a little bit a fair bit of fiction, and that's also based on the fact that I ha- I. I do believe that our brains need a little bit of fiction to open those neural pathways so that you start thinking and dreaming about others. You just to catch up on top of the ideas. Yeah. And in fact, it's often true that once I've read, a, I, I'm, I'm, I'll give you an idea. I'm a massive Terry Pratchett. Me too. Sam Vimes, fabulous character. Love him. If I read one of those, my brain starts firing on all kinds of other cylinders I didn't know I had. And how, and how. Fantastic. Well, I do miss Terry Pratchett because I have not recent, because there is no new book and I've read all of them, which you've probably also done. I, I don't wake up my wife anymore at 12 o'clock to say, you must hear this. This is funny. <laughs> Fantastic. Have you read the, the Long Earth series? The Long Mars, Long Earth, Long Earth. I got about halfway through, I got to the Long... Yeah, I'm not... Yeah, yeah. it's all right. Yeah. Or the science of the disc world. I didn't really get into them either. Darwin's watch and stuff like that. I didn't. Oh, got really get into it. You know, I think the first thing I started reading from Pratchett was um, the fourth. What's it? The fourth turtle? Is it? Is the it fifth the elephant. The fifth elephant. The fourth turtle. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, the fifth elephant. That was just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Brumpeting out of the sky came the fifth elephant. I love that. <laughs> it slipped off the back of the turtle all the way down and just landed there. Ah. ah. And the characterizations, but but because it is also so telling and descriptive of modern life um, in its metaphor, it is even better. Absolutely. And such a satirist. Absolute. I mean, he was uh, holding a mirror, very, very um, swift, like, you know, like Gulliver's Travels, holding this mirror up to us. Yeah. Paul, if you, if you ask me as well, so I'm, I'm often asked by when you go and speak to students at universities, what else should you do? And I do tell them. How much are you reading? Hmm. I often ask, sir, are you reading at least a book a week? And I don't, honestly, I, I, I don't care much about what it is you read, but I do think that your brain wants to read something. And I also don't think that that's limited to the job you do yeah. or the level you're at, or whether you're an apprentice. Yeah. I once had this experience. I, I, I've traveled to India about three times, all three times for business. Um, the first time I, uh, I realized that there were many bookshops, and I, 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 I'm not absolutely sure, but I suspected that people were, were that, that, that those books in the shops were not, um, were not being published by the original publisher. Um, and I thought, isn't that just amazing? A country in which people duplicate books because there's a need for people to read them. Yeah, you're not knocking off computer software, you're knocking off books. And then I say, just knock them off. That's wonderful. How can people find you if they want to work with you? Talk to you. They can yeah. find me on LinkedIn, and I'm just Barry Foster, B A R R Y, the surname V O R S T E R. If you, uh, I think I'm called Elon Barry on Twitter. Well, I'll put the links into the description of this uh, piece. And then anybody is always welcome to also uh, send me a, an email at bfoster at video.co.za. Barry Foster, thank you very much indeed for joining. Thank you, Paul. It's been lovely. That's a wrap. Thank you for joining me today. Your homework is to leave your five-star review and please, any comments you have, you really help me to improve every day. And it also helps people to discover me online. You should check out practical-leadership.academy because you want to help your new managers succeed with hybrid or remote working.